I first want to welcome our Washington and our C-SPAN audiences to the New America Foundation. My name is Patrick Doherty, and I help run the American Strategy Program here at New America. Today's event is entitled The W Generation, How the World's Youth See America. We are especially pleased to have with us Amar Bakshi, a reporter and blogger for both the Washington Post and Newsweek. I should start by saying that though I may have a youthful glow, I am not in fact a member of the W Generation. My generation was defined more by the fall of the Berlin Wall than by George W. Bush and 9-11. I should also point out that Steve Clemens, my boss here at the American Strategy Program and author of the blog, thewashingtonnote.com, <laughs> is here today. But Steve is neither from the Berlin Wall nor the W generation, and I'll just leave it at that. But Amar is. And early this month, Amar returned from around the world assignment called How the World Sees America with the goal of talking to people across the globe and listening to how they view the United States and then sharing and discussing those stories through his blog. It looks as though it was a really fascinating trip. <coughs> Today we've asked Amar to focus on one particular slice of this exploration, young people whose primary experience of America has been with George W. Bush as President of the United States. While you might ask what a program on American strategy want to learn about and share with the nation one reporter's take on how the world sees America. For me, the answer is simple. Successful American strategy in the 21st century relies on the world believing that America's global role is broadly consistent with their own interests and aspirations. Today, I believe that the policies that America has been pursuing, well, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, policies based largely on national interests derived from an increasingly unstable and unsustainable American economic engine, are diverging from the very urgent economic, social, and political needs of the rest of the world. Though the instances where American policies are having a clear and immediate negative impact on daily people's daily lives are limited, the long-term reality is that where once our economic engine did our strategic heavy lifting, outcompeting the Soviet Union and attracting nations into alignment with the free world, today our foreign policy is predominated by economic defense. An American economy powered by oil dependent on cheap commodities and endless housing expansion is proving unstable at home and cannot be extended abroad. If America is not delivering what the world needs, someone else eventually will. And they are. As my colleague Parag Khanna has argued in his book Second World, there are two rising alternatives to an American superpower. Europe with its vast economic market, high consumer safety standards and principled positions on human rights, and China with its voracious appetite for energy, resources and markets, and a relative disregard for consumer safety and human rights. With alternative power centers, not to mention our own well-documented missteps in Iraq and in the war on terror, America's ability to shape a friendly international order is diminished, while major converging challenges get harder and harder to address. Some of those challenges are well known, like climate change and energy security. But the biggest among these, in my book, is designing a global economic engine that can sustainably include the estimated 4.5 billion people left out of the formal globalized marketplace. And most of those 4 billion are under the age of 30. And that means few have known in America without George W. Bush in the White House. That's my view from the 30,000 feet. Today our guest, Amar Bakshi, will share what he's found talking to and blogging about real individuals in a lot of critical countries, like India, Pakistan, Turkey, Israel, Palestine, Venezuela, and Mexico. The project was launched with the help. The project was launched with the help of David Ignatius and Fareed Zakaria, uh, who together run the interactive web feature Post Global, where Amar was the first editor. Amar is also the founder of Aina Arts, a nonprofit organization connecting local artisans with schools in the developing world, and was associate managing editor of the Oxford International Review. He graduated from Harvard in 2006, writing his thesis on media propaganda in Zimbabwe. A quick note on format. In a moment, I will ask Amar to speak for 20 to 30 minutes. I'll ask a quick question or two, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. I'll ask you to keep your questions relatively short, as I will have to repeat them for our C-SPAN audience. Please help me give a warm welcome to Amar Bakshi. Yeah? Okay. Thank you, Patrick. 
Thank you, Steve. Thank you, New America, for having me. Uh, and thank you, C-SPAN, for being here. I will keep my tawdry stories until after the cameras leave. Uh, for now, I think the urgent task is for me to lower your expectations. And I will begin by doing that by telling you a little bit about myself. I, uh, I graduated from Harvard in 2006, so I'm 23. I'm kind of smack in the W generation. Uh, in high school, my senior year, 9-11 happened. Just before that, obviously, Bush was elected. I kind of came of political consciousness in that age. Um, but Zimbabwe, who actually a good friend of mine is in the audience who brought me there and introduced me to the country, Zimbabwe is what got me interested in anti-Americanism. Uh, I did my senior thesis on political propaganda there. And I remember standing at a bar called Brass Monkey in Bulawayo, one of the opposition strongholds. And there were two men competing over this beautiful, tall Zimbabwean girl. And man number one and man number two were both losing. They just couldn't get her interest. And uh, proud, my friend was dancing. I don't dance, so I eavesdropped on this conversation and heard man number one whisper to man number two, I know what you said about George W. Bush. I know you want George W. Bush to come in and overthrow Mugabe, just like he overthrowed Saddam. I'll, let, I'll make sure they know. And with that, a kind of veiled threat that he would let the secret police know, the boy number two ran out of the bar, and boy number one remained and got the girl. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is a terrific example of anti-Americanism at work in the local level. And I thought I would try the trick someday. But unfortunately, the trick worked against me as an American, and I found myself after four months in the country being trailed by the Central Intelligence Organization unwittingly. And as I left the country, they made their presence known to me and arrested me for five days, accusing me of being a CIA spy. This is when George Bush became particularly personal to me because they asked me repeatedly, do you support George Bush's policies? Are you a ne neoliberal neocolonialist? Are you a spy? And I told him I went to Harvard and I was doing my thesis. And because Ivy League schools were known to be the breeding grounds of noblesse, noblige spies, it didn't help very much. <laughs> but I found myself in jail being interrogated by a man named Ghana, who, when others were around, was as adamant as you can possibly be. You know, you are a spy, I know it. But as soon as, you know, the cameras went off, so to speak, and the rest left the room, he said, you know, I really like Malcolm X. I really like Oprah Winfrey. Uh, and I really like hip-hop. You're all engaged in the same struggle I am. And he kind of gave me this wink and a grin, and it could have read two ways. Either he really likes uh, them because they overthrowed some white imperial power just like he's trying to, but that really wasn't it. It was that he, like them, were struggling at one point against an unjust system of rule, and it was a veiled attack on Mugabe. I thought, huh, interesting, my jailer is doing this to me. And then as questions devolved, as they do over time, the questions became, are all Americans who are skinny automatically celebrities? The assumption being that we're all obese, and I did very little to dissuade them of that. <laughs> and the second question being, you know, you're a documentary filmmaker, do you love Michael Moore? And I thought, huh, I guess, you know, he seems like a pleasant guy. Anyway, five days go by, I get out, and on my final sheet where they sign me out of jail, they ask, who is your tribal chief? And of course, I put George W. So that is what got me interested in anti-Americanism. I landed up in home under house arrest, and I swore to my parents I wouldn't leave the country for three years. So I had to come up with a really good reason to get out, and I was itching to leave home. And I pitched How the World Sees America to Fareed Zakaria and David Ignatius. They agreed to fund it, and that's where this story begins. Uh, so I set off really not knowing what I was going to do in May of last year, 2007, to England. And I started interviewing you know, young, attractive female theater students, <laughs> young, attractive female singers, and then I just cut to the chase and did young, attractive female beauty contestants until my editors kind of gave me a nod and a wink and I woke up to the reality that I can't do this for one year straight. And that's where it began to turn slightly more serious. I decided to go to Blackburn, which is a community that is split 30% Muslim, 70% white, down a road called Wally Range. Uh, it's perpetually <laughs> dreary <laughs> and rainy, as far as I could tell. And there's a lot of racial tension going on. It's known to be a city with one of the most mosques in Europe. And a number of suspected 7-7 participants in the terrorist attack were, uh, were from there. And I sat down with a group of men about my age, 23 to 26. And without prodding them, they started talking about the United States. And they began to weave a story collectively, 20 of them over hookah in the men's you know, club uh, at night. And they said first, that their cousin, who was a British uh, Pakistani, 
had been detained by the MI6, British secret police, and tortured and accused uh, of plotting terrorist activity to which he subsequently uh, admitted and was locked up in jail. They say this is a, a, a egregious uh, abuse of their community and they think it's part of a wider conspiracy to, uh, to rid this community of Muslims. The second story, and you know, these, I can't verify any of these, I'm just telling you what the narratives were, was of a British man they called Jeffrey who fought in Afghanistan and then came back to England and basically worked to sell drugs on the one hand and plot violence on the other, using Muslim Britons as a foil so that they could prolong the war in Afghanistan a la Vietnam. Another, you know, another story saying the blame is not on us, the blame is elsewhere. And then the third story was inevitably about Bush. And they cited the documentary Loose Change, which you can find on YouTube, or if not YouTube, some online video service will definitely have it. And it's about how Bush basically plotted 9-11 and how it was an excuse to invade Iraq and ultimately eradicate Islam. So all of a sudden, uh, my views on both my project, you know, with these girls, I was asking them, what do you think of Jerry Springer? Or what do you think of uh, uh, Berlin versus New York as a site to do uh, singing? And now, when I just sat back and listened, I began to get this very complex narrative that had been built up over many years, but was very firmly entrenched in this young community that is just, as we said, coming of age now. Uh, but I was very particularly interested in this idea of uh, a war against Islam, which is something you hear often uh, in, in a numerous countries from young Muslims. And I, I really wanted to figure out somewhat why. So I asked a guy named Fawaz, who's uh, from, from Walthamstow, London. He's 20 years old. Walthamstow's another Muslim ghetto with a lot of ethnic cleavages and violence, gang violence. And asked him, you know, wh why would the U.S. try to eradicate Islam? And he said, uh, the U.S. is on the decline. They feel alienated and ostracized from their own families. There's no connection. And they know that we have meaning. And it was so eerily reminiscent of what I've heard Bush say. They love us for our freedoms. They love us for our values this whole black and white split between us and them, and a fundamental cleavage on worldviews. And that, I think, in the end, was what this narrative was coming to, that, it's not, that there is something more than these specific actions at play. So I'll give you just one story, and then I'll quickly go through some of the bullet points so I can wrap up what I'm saying. But one story was from a guy named Hanif Kader, who was one of these gang members in his 20s. Now he's 32. He has a young boy, about nine years old. And he uh, left for Afghanistan when the war broke out, and he decided to go fight with the Taliban. And he said to me, you know, they had been sharing horrible images of brutalities in Afghanistan, young boys with their private parts blown off, terrible things. And whether the Taliban did it or the U.S., didn't matter. They said it was the U.S. And they shared it basically over email by telling people to log into the same account. So they never sent these emails to one another, but they had a shared account that they showed me with just the most horrific images you can imagine. And he said, you know, this is what inspired me to go, take up arms. He flew to Peshawar and started migrating across into Afghanistan to join the battle. And on the way there, he saw a truck full of young Taliban kids, literally his kids' age, 9 to 15 to 16, who had been thrown into battle, barely armed, certainly untrained, to collect bullets in their chest. And he saw one boy who reminded him just of his son. And he thought, you know, this is not black and white. And he raced back to uh, England and has since then set up something called the Active Change Foundation, which is a really remarkable program that tries to get young Muslim kids off the streets uh, and show them that this is a much more complex issue than, uh, is, than it's being presented as in the media that they're getting through the shared networks. Um, so all of this, I think, showed me, well, one, how sophisticated the method of sharing information among youth is, how terribly dangerous that can be when it's an entirely different media structure than Al Jazeera or whatever else we might claim is the source of all our problems. And that it is something that's very hard to tap into unless, you, unless there's an, uh, a person in the community who's personally experienced something that can run against the narrative that's building over time. Now I, you know, I went to a dozen other, other countries. I went to England, India, Pakistan, uh, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, South Korea, Philippines, Venezuela, and Mexico. And there's no way I'm going to go through all of that now. I'm just going to quickly give you six points uh, that I think are worth considering on this issue of how the youth are different than their parents. And then we can open it up for more detailed discussion afterwards, and I'll show you some videos. Um, I think the first uh, point that's very important is there tends to be, and this is a broad generalization, but there tends to be less nuance in terms of how younger people see the United States, particularly because George Bush, well, because they've only seen it with one president at the helm. Let's just put it that way. And 
a lot of older people will talk about love and hate. A lot of younger people don't even bother. Um, I'll just give you uh, one example, Washington Post brand. I mean, I go around, I say I'm a Washington Post reporter. If I talk to an old person, they'll say, oh, Watergate, you know, you guys toppled a corrupt dictator without violence. We've been trying to do that here our whole lives. It never works, you know. America is a bastion of legality and honest democracy. If you talk to younger people, they just have no idea what the Washington Post is. And uh, if they do, it's generally about, you know, how adamantly anti-Chavez we are or anti-whatever. It's a very particular view that I've been getting about the Washington Post brand. Um, and you see the split within families and you see the split within societies. Korea is a, is a prime example that we can go into in more detail. But a lot of older people uh, have seen, obviously, the Korean War. They've seen uh, the advent of missionaries in their country and have a much more positive view and, uh, in tangent, a much stronger line towards North Korea than their kids. For example, Yonggi Cho runs the largest congregation on earth uh, with a million Pentecostal people. He's adamantly pro-United States. But his flock were part of the demonstrations that went against U.S. bases in Korea uh, in the past, in recent years, after uh, a U.S. Uh, truck ran over some Korean girls. Uh, so uh, you see a little bit less contestation in the younger communities of the types of narratives. You see more in the older ones. Um, you know, again, Pakistan, just to give you another quick example, uh, the whole issue of, you know, uh, Americans are loved for their culture, but they're despised for their foreign policy. Or Americans as a people are loved, and Americans as a government are hated. America as a government. These are the types of distinctions you get all the time with older people. But it's a little bit blurrier with younger. I'll give you an example. Zia al-Haq was supported by the United States largely and was interpreted that way by Pakistanis in the 1980s as they tried to Islamize the country. A lot of big rockers, a huge drag queen TV celebrity, a number of big cultural figures grew up in this time and say, you know, your government was doing terrible things, but your rock and roll, Bruce Springsteen, represented, you know, individualism, it represented pushing back against authority, etc. Younger people, when they look at Britney Spears or some of the bigger cultural exports coming out of the United States, can read it in the same vein of, yeah, it's enjoyable, it has high production values, but it's overproduced, and it's part of the same materialistic culture of the United States. So while there still is support for U.S. culture, you see this in the polls, I think you will find more and more of a split uh, over time. Um, I'm just going to shoot out the other one. I think one thing to watch in the narratives is how political they are versus how emotional they are. In the Philippines, older generations tend to talk about Marcos and the regime then and U.S. support. Younger generations generally don't. They talk about the rape of Nicole, who's a, a young Filipino girl in Mindanao in the south who was gang raped allegedly by a group of American soldiers just a couple years back, and it's a huge controversy there. And it sort of breaks down like the O.J. Simpson case, you know, in terms of your views on race in the United States and whether you think he's guilty or not. A little bit analogous to your views on the United States, and or I might have said race before, views on the United States and whether you think Nicole was raped or she was faking this whole thing. Um, and again, you find the split very clearly along age lines. Um, just briefly, less distinction between government and people. I mentioned that before. But... Uh, there's sort of this inherent tension in the view that America's government and America's people are separate. Because if this is a democracy and we uphold the ideals of a democracy, then either the American people are ignorant of the world, which is largely a view that's held, or they're malicious, which is less viewed but is growing, I suspect, or that they're being duped by, you know, well, by a, 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 a political elite that doesn't represent their interests. That's the type of thing you hear very strongly in Venezuela, for example, from people on, across the aisles. Uh, and then the last two things are the issue of being more information than ever before, but less explanation than ever before. The narratives that are building up have a lot more support from recent events than I think historically would have been the case. For example, in Turkey, uh, in 2003, uh, at the outset of the Iraq War, a bunch of Turkish troops were hooded by American Marines happened on July 4th, and they were hooded and taken into custody for 90 hours and questioned. And it was a huge blow to Turkey's esteem, a NATO ally, and it was big news. didn't make news in the United States. But it prompted, in part, a book that sold 600,000 copies in 2004 called Metal for Tina. I'll show you the author, young guy, 29 when he wrote it, or 28. And it's basically about how the U.S. and Turkey engage in a, uh, a war to the end of time. And a suitcase nuke gets detonated in the United States, and... Uh, it takes the EU and Russia to prevent America from parceling up Turkey to its Greek and Armenian neighbors, which is sort of the ultimate blow uh, to a Turk. 
It was then turned into the highest grossing movie of all times. This conspiracy theory about America's Middle East project to redivide the borders and subjugate the Muslim world. So it's not just traded on small levels, it can erupt at the larger levels. And you see that also with PKK protests against the Kurdish Workers Party. The chants were, curse the PKK, curse the USA in October. And maybe that's changed now because of our policies. Uh, and, and then finally, and this is sort of a mixed blessing, I think people are less convinced of the super power status of the United States. This young kid in, uh, in Venezuela asked his uncle, why do they keep making these Mission Impossible movies if they can't even topple Saddam Hussein? That there's a disconnect between what we show and what we can actually do. So I, I haven't been in the business of prescriptions, but I'll briefly give you a, a few things that I think are important to keep in mind. As I said before, very high-minded rhetoric can be dangerous because it fuels room for conspiracy theories when we don't live up to the ideals we set and when they're not pro properly articulated. Uh, sort of like, you know, what Elliot Spitzer, the hypocrisy charge is worse than, than anything else. Um, I think the important point is to listen and not to sell because I think a goal for us should be not to be loved but, not, but to try not to be hated. It's a more modest goal but I think that it's an important one to keep in mind and one way of doing that is puncturing the narratives that are building and hardening. And this can be done regardless of broad policies to Israel, Afghanistan, or whatever else, which often prevent us from thinking we can do anything about America's image in the world. New media is a, a very powerful tool. And I'll close with an example from Lebanon of a young kid who was about 15 years old and during the July War in 2006 was being uh, bombed, basically, in the Shia suburbs. His father is a leader in Hezbollah. And, uh, you know, he's certainly not very politically conscious, but he did think that the U.S. and Israel were, were behind the bombings. And he was playing Warcraft. <laughs> World of Warcraft, an online game, with a kid named Tom from Kansas. And as bombs were literally falling just a couple hundred feet from his house, he was stuck in his basement, and he wrote to Tom, you know, real bombs are falling outside. And Tom writes back, real bombs suck, man, I'm with you. And he even has a little screen grab of this. And as he talks to me now, 15 years old, this hasn't changed his view of Israel or the United States entirely but at least it's punctured what otherwise could be a very hardened and depressing narrative. And I think for all of us, we should think about how we can do this short of broad policy changes, especially within the W generation itself. And uh, with that, let's go to questions and then we'll show some videos. Thank you, Omar. Yeah. Um, why don't you go ahead and stay at the, at the okay. podium. Got it. Um, I'll just stand up here. Um, first, that I just have to comment on the, on the Warcraft, World of Warcraft. Uh, story um, to show the difference in generations. Uh, when my colleagues from my generation, uh, when I was working in Bosnia, um, were having bombs rain down on them in the siege of Sarajevo, they were playing um, Dungeons and Dragons in the basement, not World of Warcraft. <laughs> so, um, but a very similar kind of situation, but yeah. well, half generation removed. Um, the question I want to ask, I guess, two. Um, first, getting to this question about. Um, uh, you're saying, does uh, public diplomacy versus better policies, I guess, is the question. Right. Um, to what extent, you said new media needs to be kind of engaged, but to what extent do we really, does America really need to have um, a better set of policies that actually impact the people in their day-to-day -day lives um, in addition to public diplomacy? Could you talk about that balance? Sure. Should I um, use this guy? Um, or do you want me to whichever is easier, yeah. Oh, well, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I, one point I didn't make, and we talked about this beforehand, was how a lot of America's broad ideals, democracy and free markets, are held by a lot of young people. Venezuela is a prime example where kids say, look, Chavez, don't oust Exxon. We need the jobs. You, we've been training in your universities. We're relatively skilled, and we're broke, and you're driving around in Hummers. So the values of the United States, I think, are very important in the expansion of our markets. And when I say collaboration, new media is sort of the hippest example, yeah. but that's really economic collaboration, it's really business collaborations that involve people. Because ultimately, I think um, it's going to require uh, transnational vested interests and shared projects to hold us together, regardless of where these policies go. And I think that's a safer bet than saying, oh, well, if we vaccinate a lot of people in Afghanistan, we'll be great, or if we give more U.S. aid, because you vaccinate a lot of people in Afghanistan, and the Nigerian press says you're trying to sterilize Afghans. So these narratives are better hit at, I think, or could be more fruitfully hit 
at the interpersonal level, and that includes business links. Great. So engaging them as partners, not so much looking at um, as aid, looking at people as aid recipients. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean that you want to engage them in, in the shared in the shared in shared endeavors that they can invest in personally. That's great. Uh, my other question was, um, yeah, that'd be easier. To what extent um, do we have an opportunity in January of 2009 to change those narratives? To what extent do you find that those narratives, uh, and, and to what, what kind of activities on the part of, say, a new president um, will actually have an impact on those narratives that have been in formation for the last eight years? I think one thing to be careful about, is this too loud? Is to be uh, overly hopeful about the next president. I mean. There are a lot of things that you might hope that someone does, and I think a lot of presidents will tell you there's a lot less at their disposal than uh, the average person, or certainly the average person around the world might think. So expectations are going to probably far exceed realities. That said, uh, there's obviously a lot of symbolic importance that, uh, that Bush has played, for example, in simply style. And you know, I think all the candidates are talking about listening. And I think that that's a very, you know, uh, it's a very fruitful way of just approaching other leaders. I mean, I met the foreign minister of Thailand just the other day, and he said basically, uh, you know, I, I've never felt so rebuffed by an administration. Or Ahmed Rashid in Pakistan, a leading light, said, you know, I risked my life to get you guys information, and you just, you forgot about it. And so these guys are influential in their own countries, and that certainly is a big precedent setter, mm -hmm. how the style of the new president uh, uh, plays out. I also think it's a little bit of a mistake how, you know, a lot of we try to frame this in conservative liberal terms and say conservatives are willing to take the hard right over the you know popular wrong and defying popular opinion is a is a virtue, uh, and and liberals sort of aren't. I, I think that it's you know seventy percent of the U.S. right now, which is more than even during Vietnam, is concerned about America's role in the world, which is a staggering number, and it certainly means unless the Democrats have mushroomed substantially, that uh, a lot of people are thinking about this beyond partisan ways, and. Um, <coughs> And so I think, I think we sh that's another reason I'm reticent to say this is all about policies, because regardless, I, I think a precipitous withdrawal from Iraq could be a disastrous. Uh, it would further this idea of an incompetent power. Likewise, you know, seeing more deaths will also. So it's not just change for change's sake. It's getting the right policies in place that really uh, make a sustainable yeah, and, um, sense of progress for these populations. And I'm sure you'd agree with me, but this is one where, place where I think Democrats who have been very concerned about America's image in the world, when they uh, embrace very uh, siege mentality rhetoric about trade and things like that, they really freak out a lot of, uh, especially elites in countries. In Mexico, for example, I was there while Obama was giving his speech, and you had people, you know, chattering at uh, what does this mean? Um, and farmers who are very anti-NAFTA say, oh, we don't trust America anyway. Even if they renegotiate, it'll hurt us in the end. So it's a lose-lose. And I think the best is for there to be real ties at the local level so they're invested. Great. That partnership. Great. Yeah. Okay, we'll open it up. Um, please speak clearly. I'm going to have to repeat the uh, question for our C-SPAN audience in the purple shirt. Uh, I'm wondering about the, the issue of uh, persistence, how long these effects will last. And I'm thinking partly of Vietnam, where the... Um, the, the young people who watched us in Vietnam seem to have become the skeptical elites of the 90s and, and 2000s. Could you talk a little about, about, about you know, how long you think the effects of the W generation, what they've witnessed, may persist? So the question is, how long will these persist um, and uh, these, these, these narratives persist in the populations? And I think a lot depends on how much play political elites can get from it. And I think that has a large amount to do with how consistent these narratives are across the population. I mean, in Pakistan, you find young people who are conservative and want Sharia law upset with the United States for anti-Islamic policies or what they perceive as it. And then you have liberal elite in some of the best schools in the country concerned about the United States uh, for supporting what they call a dictator and harp uh, boosting the military too much. And I think that that makes a situation rife for sustained anti-American rhetoric to consolidate political gains. Um, so I, th I suspect in a place like Pakistan, this will last uh, for, for quite a while. Um, but for example, in Venezuela, where there's been a lot of an attempt at anti-American language, et cetera, and similarly in Zimbabwe, where there's a lot of resistance towards the local leader and anti-Americanism is being deployed for local political purposes uh, in a very partisan way, I think you're going to find uh, a little bit less uh, a continuation of it. I hope that answers to some extent. Um. Okay, uh, right here in the black. Um, since you deal with the interpersonal level mostly, how do you, and you talked briefly about foreign aid, how do you feel that um, 
competitive-based aid programs like the MCC have been affecting people at the interpersonal level? How, so the question is, how do you feel that competitive aid programs like the Millennium Challenge Corporation um, have been affecting people at the local level? It doesn't, you know, I don't think it reads at the local level. Um, that said, I mean, I think that it's the right way to go. Uh, I think that, you know, you want to put up these transparent metrics and follow them. Uh, I think aid, as it's interpreted at the local level, is a very interesting phenomenon because when you look at the type of aid programs, for example, going in southern Philippines, you have the Japanese who are investing in big infrastructural projects and the U.S. that's investing in sort of USA gem projects that are much more about livelihood assistance and things like that. And the perennial question is, will, uh, will the Filipino Muslims in that area stop sort of licking the hand of the U.S. once they stop, stop feeding it? So I think that in the long term, you know, you want to set up these big transparent metrics and work towards them, that because one of the, the moral hazards or the, the hazards of direct aid is that uh, the dependency will lead to more anger when it's given up if it's not done right. I think that's a big risk in the Philippines, for example. Great. Okay. Right here. Uh, yeah. To what extent uh, have you uh, were people you were engaging with talking about the presidential elections, and to what extent did they um, uh, did they kind of connect with the Obama, Obama. candidacy? Well, I, I I went to a cigarette vendor in Mexico City, and Obama was big on the cover of the newspaper, and I was like, "What do you think of Obama?" And he said, "Isn't that Will Smith?" <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if, if, that, if that gives you anything. I think that. Uh, I think that, I think that honestly, Obama has become a force towards the end of my project. So I only saw him in Venezuela and Mexico. No one really knew who he was in the countries I was in before then. Uh, and in Venezuela, you get a lot of interesting people who are very, very pro, uh, very, very pro Obama, and kind of on the fence with Chavez. General Baduel was sort of the leader of Chavez's army, Secretary of Defense, essentially, and he left recently uh, over the referendum. And he's a diehard uh, Obama supporter. And he, you know, he says, one, he's very excited about the idea of dialogue because he thinks even though he disagrees with Chavez, it's an important first step. Um, and then there's always this identity issue. I mean, there's no real escaping the idea that a lot of people look to come to the United States as immigrants. And the narrative of Obama of becoming this presidential candidate from, you know, for those who do know it, which tends to be in the elite circles, uh, it's a very appealing one. Even in India, where Bill Clinton is very, very popular, a lot of uh, elite in the press are excited about Obama. And that says a lot because, to be honest, India is quite a racist country. I mean, there's a lot of racism going on. And, um, and Bill was extraordinarily popular. You see him on elephants everywhere. And, uh, and, yet, and yet Obama, because of this identity issue, I think, it's part of the Indian dream of coming to America and rising the ranks. Okay, great. Um, let's see who, <coughs> questions over here. Um, during your travels, what were the standard cliches that were trotted out about America the most? Uh. You know, for example, I lived in Belgium for a long time. Healthcare was the one thing, the idea that if you were on the pavement dying and it was pouring yeah. from you, that they'd rummage for your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> kind of yeah, absolutely. So there's this guy named Freddy Guevara, who's one of the leading guys in Venezuela of the student movement. He's exactly 20 years old, and he has like 40,000 people listening to him on the streets, and he, in December 2, defeated Chavez with a couple other friends. I mean, a really remarkable character. And... Uh, and one of the greatest critiques he makes of the United States is just on this line. When I ask him what his model democracy is, what his model society is, he says absolutely not the United States, which uh, doesn't have enough uh, political representation. He calls the Democrats and the Republicans the same. Uh, like you said, is overly capitalistic and has no social service net. And in contrast, he looks to Scandinavian countries. I mean, he says that those are the models that I'd like to uphold. And he supports this guy, Theodora Petkoff, who is a leftist guerrilla who's very anti-Chavez, now runs a paper. Um, so that, that, I think, you know, uh, there's a really good typology. Maybe I'll just rattle it off that Robert Cohane of Princeton just recently wrote a book called Anti-Americanisms with a bunch of other people. And he defines uh, liberal anti-Americanism as, you know, Americans are for human rights, but they have Guantanamo Bay. They're hypocrites. Social anti-American is, is exactly what you said. Uh, Americans are so consumeristic, they let their people rot, their democracy is a sham. And then the third one, sovereign, is sort of what I encountered in, in Zimbabwe. America is imperialistic, it's trying to n meddle in our affairs. We need to reclaim our dignity culturally, politically, economically, and it's sort of a siege mentality. And then radical, which is what I was talking about in Blackburn, where the views of the Americans are antithetical to the views of our way of life. And just to qualify, even in Hebron, in Israel, 
a lot of Israeli settlers will say the same thing, that Americans don't understand fundamentally the Israeli project and that they're a risk to the Israeli settlers in Hebron. So just so it's not just on Islam, I think it's important to point that out. So long story short, I think, I think that you see a lot of this type of thing coming out of Europe, out of Venezuela, for example. Um, and in Zimbabwe, you get more of the sovereign rhetoric. In England, you get more of this liberal rhetoric. Yeah. Sure. Okay, uh, one more up front here. Right. Okay. So the question is, um, to what, how do you see the policies of this W generation starting to evolve as this generation starts to think about the world and how to uh, organize it? Yeah, and I, I was taking it largely as like an identity question as well. How do you how do you frame yourself within the world when national boundaries are either getting stronger or weaker? Just before I go into that, does it remind me of one thing, which is an interesting trend as, as nations become more, uh, more ethnically conscious, which you see, you know, or sub-nations becoming more ethnically conscious. This idea of uh, foreign meddling is sort of an interesting foil that they can use to uh, legitimate sort of separatist political practices. I'm just like, thinking of the Kurds in Turkey, for example. Uh, but on the question there, I think that there's a lot of uh, hope, for example, in one of the, a big project that I, I've seen is run out of Trinity College, and it, it's a hip hop festival that connects East Africa with, you know, I guess New England. You know, I mean, kind of unexpected, but they get five or six thousand people. They're forming all these really interesting groups that are addressing these big social issues. There's, um, there are web activist communities, for example, that I think are pretty interesting. Uh, the other issue, it's really complicated, but the diaspora of the American diaspora, the Armenian diaspora, the Filipino diaspora, etc have a lot to do with how their host countries, home countries, for original countries, view the United States. And uh, I mean, I think it's both good and bad. Um, with, uh, with the Armenian community, for example, in Turkey, there's a sense that sort of a lot of the wrangling going on here for Armenian identity recognition costs them political points at home. Uh, whereas, you know, I think for the Filipino community, the left is getting strengthened by a bunch of young Filipino American students going over to pretty much the most left-leaning universities in the country and have very much this idea of toppling the oligarchy and et cetera, et cetera. So I think the immigrant community in the United States is a, a real potential. It can also be a bit of a hazard. And I think these identities will grow stronger, you know, and I think that that can be very fruitful. It's exactly the type of thing we were saying is, uh, has great hope. Could you talk a little bit more about this dynamic of it's, it's kind of the end of the brain drain. I, I saw something on your blog where there was a doctor in India who, yeah. who did his work in New York City for about 10 or 20 years and then went back and set up this really cutting edge research institute um, back in Chennai. I don't know if yeah, where it was. In, in Delhi, yeah. In Delhi. Um, could you talk about that dynamic of, of professionals going back to their home countries and making changes there? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of people who talk just like that. They say, we want our kids to go to the U.S. because they have great higher education. We want them to come back because there's less regulation here. There's uh, more rapid growth. We have great potential to do innovative research. There's less of a silo mentality, for example, in the U.S. You have academics in their little holes. Here, it's much more fluid. We can interact. We can collaborate, and there's a lot of venture capital money that we can get from the United States to invest here, and we know these markets better than anyone else. So there's a whole host of reasons, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a terrific thing, again, for the United States to get this type of thing. It's going to lower our cost of health care in the future if we go there for cardiac bypass surgery one day, you know, and that's exactly what they hope, that they'll be treating European and American clients. My dad's a doctor. He left from India, and his teacher is now there, and he says, you know, back when my dad and, his, and this guy were in class together, almost everyone went to the United States. And now that number has fallen radically, they're diversifying, going to other countries, and a lot of the ones who do leave come back within a decade. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay, right here. When you, when you use the, the phrase, uh, the United States is trying to exterminate Islam, and you represent that as an attitude or a belief among the young, uh, is that your gloss on their narrative? Right. Or is it actually, are those words, is that phrase part of their narrative? Oh, yeah. And is that the hyperbole of you? What, what happens when they confront us back? Right. 
Right. To, so the question is, to what extent is the, the uh, narrative that America is trying to exterminate Islam uh, a, a function of Amar's, um, uh, is, is, is it his language or is it what the people are saying actually on the ground? Yeah, uh, one phrase stuck out. I heard this in Maligon, India, verbatim, a systematic conspiracy to eradicate Islam and Muslims from the imam of a, a mosque or a, a madrasa that has about 300 kids. And the question I asked him was, when you believe this, how do you tell your kids not to hate the United States? And his response is, Islam is not a religion of violence. Uh, the cruel will reap what they sow. America will die its own death. But the language of uh, eradicating Islam is, is not my own. I mean, I think if there are others in this audience who've been there, they'll, I think, corroborate that you hear uh, these words quite often. Now, in terms of uh, hyperbole of youth, I... This is, I think, the question with this project and with this whole topic. Well, it, you know, as events change, will the fundamental views of these youth change over time? How entrenched are they? And then is it just, you know, young people don't know much about the world, they're really rabid and excited or whatever else? I tend to think that these narratives have built up very, very uh, slowly and that they're not just with the younger generation. I mean, the older, the guy I just mentioned was 55 years old, and when no, new, new news reports come in, for example, the, uh, I was there during the, the Red Mosque siege in Pakistan, and circulating all among the, the vernacular press in southern India was an image of a U.S. helicopter over the mosque, and the headline in Urdu <coughs> was essentially uh, the U.S. backs entirely and aids the destruction of this mosque. So. I mean, it's in the press, you know. You might not get it as overtly in Al Jazeera, but you're going to get it in local press. You're going to get it in email exchanges. Um, I think it would be a mistake to discredit it as a, a sort of, you know, kids will be kids kind of thing. Um, and it does, in cases, lead to action, which is another reason why we should take it seriously. Okay. We're going to go back for a question, and while we're moving the microphone, a question for you. Um, sure. To what extent are these narratives being transferred, transmitted through the Internet or through social networks or some other traditional media? To what, what did you find? I found generally it was both. I mean, that these are small social networks of a couple hundred members that live in a, in a target community and reference a couple sources of broader news, but somewhat selectively. I mean, so this is the web guys, middle class people, lower middle class, and particularly in England and Pakistan. And, uh, and like I said, I mean, they will share these news clips just like we share Obama clips here. Uh, they get a lot of views. And then there tend to be these nodal points where leaders of one community and another tend to know each other, either through religious or political reasons, and so it circulates. So you don't find as much variation as you would think, considering how socially constructed these narratives are. But they get entrenched because they are. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot, I think, to break out of it. Any message that comes from the United States is read as not part of this social network. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the challenge, is, is getting key players in there to share a different narrative. Great. OK, in back. Um, the lady in, in the back, yeah. The um, as an American, I guess my question that I've asked other speakers before is what can I really do to actually be to the Definitely. Okay. So two questions. Uh, as a member of this generation, what can we do uh, to make a difference? And then uh, to what extent is the, the, the various conflicts in Pakistan, is it America, perceived as an American war uh, in Pakistan and r in reality? I guess it is perceived as an American war, but is it also perceived yeah. Well, I'm just curious, what do, you, what do you do? I mean, what work do you do? Um, I'm a researcher. Okay. Well, I mean, I think in answer to this question, what I, I often say is, depending on what you do, try to take a little bit more of a transnational angle on it. I think not only do you potentially open up new markets, make new contacts, and create something that could be more exciting and surprising, but it does address this problem in sort of the private sector, day-to-day -day way. I just think, for example, if we had a you know, a reality TV show that instead of, or more reality TV shows that instead of focusing on an abandoned island took place throughout, you know, Western Africa or took place in South Asia. 
it could be lively, it could be fun, it could be lucrative, and you can tap into a new audience. Uh, and I think that the more people think like that, uh, the more we'll form these things organically. Uh, and so that's, I think, how I would play it. And I mean, just in terms of this video blog, when I, when I proposed it, my editor said, you know, no one's interested in, uh, in the world. And these are two guys who were, like, have made their name writing about the world. And they said, you really have to try to do it in a different way. And especially young people. That, you know, if you're 23, you really got to do a play to young people. So how are you going to do that? And my argument was, well, you know, you can make videos fun. You can do stuff on drag queens and beauty contestants and people you don't expect to hear from. And maybe that will generate a younger audience. And, and it did. And I think this project wouldn't have worked had I not appealed directly to that base. So for me, financially, it was successful. And I, I think that, you know, it can easily be replicated in other, in other fields. About the Pakistan thing, I mean, I don't know the poll numbers offhand, but I mean, there's, you know, adamant anger about uh, terrorist attacks and adamant anger about the United States. And one thing you'll hear is that America's war on terror is not our war on terror. You hear that in Turkey as well, when they were very upset that Kurdish Workers' Party could bomb them almost with impunity, is how it was seen, and America would try to tie the hands of the country. Now, in Pakistan, the reading is, you know, they've gone in and they've bombed wherever they felt like bombing, unilaterally, and then the terrorists, because they live on our ground, come and strike us in Lahore, and so we can't have our rock concert or we can't have our TV showing because we're too afraid to do it. And if we could get more of a handle on this situation, we could protect ourselves. Why are we the base for America's war? So I think that that's when you see these odd numbers of a lot of support for Osama bin Laden. I'm a little bit suspicious about what those numbers really mean. I think a lot of it is a great dissatisfaction with how the U.S. is waging the war on terror, but nobody likes to be killed in massive numbers. I think Pakistan brings up a good question for you. Um, to what extent are uh, the drivers of some of these narratives really local issues? I think pa when I think of Pakistan, I think that the, th that the right. issue that really brought people out into the streets was the sacking of the Supreme Court, right. and it was lawyers. Right. It was it was lawyers, not Taliban, who were leading those protests, yeah. um, and that's what kind of triggered this most recent. Um, round of upheaval. So to what extent is it an, is it, are these local narratives, local conflicts playing into this global narrative? A good example again is in southern India, uh, in Kerala, where there's a guy named Palakoya who leads a, the NDF, which is a National Democratic Front, and it was accused of being part of the Mumbai train bombings just the other year. So it's, it's a pretty radical outfit. But when you listen to his, him speak, what he'll say is the Hindu extremists, the capitalist Indian elite, and the American uh, Israeli lobby are conspiring uh, together to fundamentally change the dynamics of our society and again playing into the eradication of Islam idea or subduing that portion of the society uh, will say look I see this happening on a day-to-day -day basis as Hindu extremists push into our turf as Hindu extremists attack our boys etc so it becomes personal because of the Hindu extremists and then it gets magnified uh, through a number of different lenses until it becomes a broader issue of America's support for these people. So I generally think, and if you look at Philippines or Mexico, the critique often is, you know, we are struggling under oligarchic forces that the United States supports for capitalist reasons. They want dole in our country, so they support, you know, Senator Gordon or whoever in, uh, in the Philippines, and this guy is going to kowtow to their interests, sacrificing ours. The real resentment is that 200 Filipino families control literally all commerce in the Philippines, and the society is suffering from a massive drain of talent. Uh, and in Mexico, you know, there's similar things, that NAFTA is numerically shown to have great promise, but a lot of corn farmers don't feel it, because they either don't know what they should be looking for, or more accurately, their lives just haven't gotten any better. And they're also reacting to these guys in the economic elite who say the United States and these free trades are good for us. So. Uh, there are many different ways it becomes localized and personalized. In the Philippines, just one other thing is, you know, this rape narrative is particularly salient because a large number of Filipino women are serving as domestic aid in the United States, so they've left family there. A large number of young Filipino women are trying to marry American men, larger than you might think, and so there's a whole online community based off of this, and there's this continuing or new phase of American presence in the south of the country that sort of exacerbates this. But at root, I mean, these are, these are local phenomena that are uh, you're able to act upon in part because of broader anti-American sentiment and able to consolidate, uh, I think, domestic support around because you can scapegoat and say, oh, we're not attacking the economic elite, we're attacking America, but it's sort of code for one and the same oftentimes. Why don't we take another question and then maybe sure. you could look at, I know you had queued up some videos. Yeah, they're each about a minute. I'll Perhaps we could show those after the next question. Yeah, um, sure. So is there another question, sir, in the, with the beard?
Can you identify yourself, sir? <laughs> That's, I think, the key point, actually. It is hard to prove that you're not. <laughs> and in secular societies, too. If anything similar, you might have turned up anything similar in the countries that you said. Yeah. So the question was, um, in uh, two countries in Europe, there were uh, polls saying that 35, 40 percent of the respondents um, thought of America as evil. Um, do you find that? What, what were the two countries? I just it was missed it. Holland and Canada. Thank you. <laughs> Canada. Uh, well, they know as well. Yeah, that's not a good thing at all. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I didn't. Field defense. What? Huh? Field defense. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, on both sides. It's about time. No, well, I, I didn't go to Europe. I, I didn't go to Canada, uh, in part because they're relatively well covered. Uh, but I just did a terrific transatlantic program with the British Council, and they're in the audience. There we go. I have a beautiful tote bag from them that's trying to address just this uh, issue of. Um, you know, w w these gross misunderstandings, presumably were not evil, of, uh, both, of both societies. Um, but now I've, I've sidetracked myself. Um, to what extent did you find that? Well, I, I think one thing that's interesting, and this poll numbers reflect as well, I just listened to a guy, Richard Wickey, at the Pew survey yesterday, reaffirming what I, I suspected, which is uh, that the distance between views of the U.S. government, views of Bush, and views of the U.S. people are coming together, and not for the good. Um, and I think as America gets homogenized in the eyes of other people, uh, some of the internal debates we're having, and we're a highly self-critical country, which some people admire and other people just have no idea about, uh, as these come together, it's easier to put the foreign policy actions on the back of people who are selfish, arrogant, malevolent, swagger, don't care about the rest of the world, are ignorant, all these tropes that I guess get lumped into evil. And when you talk to a lot of people and you look at the characteristics that the Pew outlines, I mean, they're all bad, and the U.S. falls very high in some surprising countries. And just to follow up on that, the other interesting statistic, and you hear it again and again, is that the U.S. poses a military threat to your country. Like 70% of Bangladeshis think the U.S. poses a threat to their country. 46% of Argentinians, you know, uh, I'm just thinking what else. And uh, an astronomical number of Turks, a NATO ally. So uh, when you put all of that together, I keep going back to war on Islam, but I mean, you know, war on more than just Islam, uh, an unbridled superpower that can act in whatever way it wants, and you can't predict its movements. That's why transparency well, is important. Let's try our first uh, film, movie right. here. Well, I just Video talked about clip. Barack Turner, so maybe I'll show you him. And what I'm going to ask you to do is actually put the microphone up to the computer speaker. Uh, I can do that. It's not a great video, but it'll show you uh, how... It'll show you how this guy looks, <laughs> which is interesting enough. All right. I can't make it big, unfortunately. So I just put it up to this? Yeah. And just hit play. America is governed by people like me, I think. Some sort of crazy imaginative and lazy people <laughs> is governing. <really. laughs> I think what I do is just say, if I was governing the whole United States, well, how I, I would act to govern the whole world, and I'm just writing these, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really something uh, wild coming from inside, you know. It looks all very intelligent, everything we see, government, states, very man, very, you know, intelligent man, but Behind all these things, I think just we have childish people, you know. They want to play power yes. games, they want to govern the world, they want to govern the solar system like in Galactica. <laughs> you know, it's, I, yeah. Is Bush one of them? No, he's not at that level. <laughs> So, <laughs> it, it would seem random, but this guy wrote the biggest selling book in Turkish history, or at least in the past 10 years, uh, within Turkey, that is. You know, should, should I show another why one? You, why, don't you, why don't we take another question while you queue up the next? Okay. Um, the gentleman in the back with the tie. This 
speak up a little bit louder. So the question is, um, can you talk about specific policy recommendations for public diplomacy, and then could you comment on the um, de-radicalization programs that have been ongoing out in the field? Sure. I've been excuse me, on the road for a year, and I just got back excuse me, two weeks ago. And I've been kind of in the business of description and, and not really prescription. But I will say that never did I have a sense of a public diplomacy effort almost throughout my entire year. Now, I mean, if that, I think that says something rather dire, or, or if it is a public diplomacy effort, they were basically reaching out to me to write a good story about their work in the Washington Post, which doesn't really do much good for the community they're in. And I don't mean to discredit it wholesale, I just frankly don't know. The other thing is, in terms of the levers at their disposal, I was giving some suggestions to the Foreign Service Institute, and then they were saying, but you know, none of these levers are at our disposal that we have these big organizational outfits, we have two press people in a country, we have a thousand people who we're going to reach out to, and we do it, and we try to make them like us, etc. And I don't think that's going to tap into the type of radical groups that I was talking about. And even in England, when uh, a State Department guy led me on to Walthamstow as a place where they were trying to do work, and, um, and I talked to the Muslim kids there, and they say, yeah, we love when the Americans come, we just laugh at them. And, uh, I mean, I, you know, to be honest, I, I sort of understood why. Because it was very, very arrogantly done. And it was more like a lecture on human values and U.S. values. And how they were synonymous with Muslim values. And they kind of nicely quote the Quran as if to prove that they read it. You know, and I think it's a real mistake to say, oh, well, if we understand the Quran, we'll understand Muslims. And we'll just tell them that Muslims have same values as us. I mean, one, it's discrediting the amount of similarities there actually are. And, uh, and two, it's really condescending. Um, so, uh, well, you know, I'm looking for a job, so if I end up going into the public diplomacy State Department thing, I'll, uh, and I'm single, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> then I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, you know, then I'll, I'll know better. But right now, right now I just don't. Um, but I think that a lot needs to be done. Great. Do you want to queue up this next video? Yeah, yeah, sure. And I guess on the de-radicalization bit, well, I, I guess I already said it. I mean, this was part of a de-radicalization effort. Uh, and I, I didn't think it was particularly fruitful. What was was Hanif Kather telling his story. And he really didn't need the U.S. to do that. If anything, when I wrote a piece about him and I mentioned that he was being supported by the U.S., he desperately told me to delete it from my article or that no one would ever listen to him again. And so, you know, I obliged. I don't want to, you know. Uh, oh, you just blew it. Oh, crap. I did just blow it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I, yeah, that's yeah. terrible. We can edit that out? <laughs> God, I'm a terrible journalist. This is what comes when you're 23. No, but I mean, it, 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 it people up online for a little bit, and some people did hear it, so it's not the end of the world. And he certainly doesn't support Bush's policies. <laughs> good save, good save. OK, yes. the next video, if you could just cue it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's cute. This is a Lebanese rapper who I'm in love with. <laughs> or it's not playing. What should I do? This seems like a web problem. Looks like uh, the post tech web technology is in need of some work. Just maybe refresh it. It's actually attempting to transfer. Oh, okay. Well, we can try another one. I can show the Philippines. I mean, just in case it's hard to hear what she's saying, it's just a Lebanese rapper. Uh, she, uh, you know, came to the Bronx and is doing partnerships with, with groups in the Bronx. Yeah, this one's not going to work. Okay, let me try the Philippines. Why don't we take another question in the meantime? Okay. Sir. To, to what extent is, um, to what extent is Israel seen as an albatross around America's neck? And how could that relationship be better presented in a more acceptable way? Um... One sec. I'll take my time answering that one. Uh, 
Unfortunately, I don't need to repeat the question, but it was, to what extent is Israel seen <laughs> as an albatross around America's neck? Okay, looks like we've got a new video. Okay, Go well, ahead and I'll take just a chat. Okay, I'll, uh, I mean, there's no, there's no doubt that it is, and there's no doubt that it fits into the narrative that a lot of people have constructed about the United States. That said, I hesitate and I don't really know what type of wholesale policy change the U.S. should make in order to appease people who are critical of our stance towards Israel. I mean, obviously, looking like we have a bit more of a... <laughs> okay, well, why don't we take our chance and then I... My real name is Lean, I'm an MC, I go with the name of Lix, and I'm also known as Malika, and I'm a part of the House of Representatives. <laughs> That's Zach's favorite person, too. <laughs> so, I, uh, when, oh, so Israel. Um, yeah, I think it plays, I mean, it's part of my whole reluctance to engage in sort of the policy debates of this, uh, because I just don't think I'm well enough versed to do that. But I will say that no one starts off in my conversations as saying, you guys support Israel, therefore, X, Y, Z. I mean, it always starts off with younger people a little bit more local, and Israel comes, or more current, and Israel comes somewhere down the line. It's like, and Israel, and Iraq, and Afghanistan, and, you know, it's one of many, many ands. So I, I don't have the sense that it's sort of like, once Israel changes, everything opens up. And that I think, I think that's a key do. component of what, you're, what this pattern that I'm seeing is that it's really rooted in the local experiences. And then these global narratives of America's role Absolutely. are added on on top of that. Absolutely. But it's really rooted in the local experience. That's my takeaway from it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, why don't we watch the rappers? Which is, uh, oh, yeah, that's the difference between Lebanon and the States. <laughs> when I went to the Bronx, I had a lot of people supporting me, especially that I'm rapping in Arabic. The American people think that Arabic is a ghetto language now, unfortunately. They think we're thugs now because we have war here. I was just chilling at Walton Avenue in the Bronx. They were all dressed up with the blood uh, flags and the, the bandanas and stuff. And they told me that, yeah, man, Arabic is so sick, man. You guys are, 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 are gangsters. Uh, and then once this guy came to me and he was like, aren't you afraid of walking in the Bronx at night? Like, you can hear gunshots anywhere. I was like, oh, dude, <laughs> I live in Lebanon where you can hear a bomb passing by you anytime, you know? I think they should be happy that they're living in very good circumstances, no matter how much they think that they are suffering or they are being mistreated. They should always remember that there are people suffering a lot more and, 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 uh, and that the three-quarter of the globe would wish to be in their position. After all those years, you now change and prove some more that I don't... Uh, so her name's Lix, uh, and she's like 22, and is doing a, a collaborative rap video with this guy in the Bronx who wasn't happy about her revealing the Blood Scripts affiliation. But, uh, but it, you know, it's an ex you know, I mean, it's an example. It punctured a lot of her first entry into the United States. She was stopped from Canada. And she had a business card from us, one of Bin Laden's brothers, who runs a lot of hard rock cafes in Lebanon and throughout the Middle East. And so he had this business card, and the agent was like looking at all the, her passport with all these Arabic stamps, and then flipping through her business cards one by one by one. And she took out this Osama, the, not Osama, but Hassan Bin Laden or something, and frantically rips it up in the bathroom and flushes it down the <laughs> toilet, you know, and then comes into the United States just like petrified for three days and races out. But she still managed to do this uh, connection with this rapper. And, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of, you'll see, I mean, a lot of people want to come to the United States, even like Hezbollah youth are always telling me and others how they intend to come to the U.S. for a little while and work. So you, you haven't lost that. But on the other hand, you get Turks and other people who are saying, well, why, why bother? You know, there are other places we can go. It's tough getting in the United States, and these visa issues are such a hassle. You hear everybody complaining about, about that. Is that an example of the kind of collaboration, successful collaboration you're uh, talking about? It uh, seems uh, like her attitudes were, were pretty well advanced. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, she also is now part of this big new project that's a collaboration between MTV and an Arabic channel that's doing uh, a new, basically, hip-hop in the Middle East project. You know, heavy metal is huge in sort of uh, uh, kind of the nations around Saudi Arabia. I mean, there are a lot of cultural connections still. They might not symbolize quite what, you know, like glam rock and cheetah pants did in the past, but they symbolize, I mean, there's still fruitful connections, you know, regardless of the symbolism. Okay, questions in the back. Uh, lady in the brown suit. The relationship 
If you can identify yourself too. So what kind of career, um, educational level and career um, profile do the people that you were interacting with have? It, it really varies. Uh, I'll tell you maybe a little bit about my method so you know. It will skew uh, towards the better educated, uh, even though I tried to fight that. And it'll skew towards the more globally minded, which should tell you, if anything, what I'm reporting to you is perhaps better <laughs> than, than you know, moderate, some of the other ones, just slightly more moderate. Uh, because you do always see that the more connections to the U.S. in the personal level, if they travel there, etc., it's, it's always better. And that might be self-selection, but it might also be a consequence of having visited the states. Um, so, uh, education and yeah. career profile. Well, uh, you know, she's college educated in Canada. This the girl I just showed you. Um, and a lot of the students I met, I mean, sort of every country I went to, I always went to a university. So I always got a university perspective. And because I didn't set out looking at this W generation, it kind of came towards the end. It was a very broad shotgun approach I took to this whole project. Um, I didn't get, you know, uh, sort of every type of youth in every type of country. That, that wasn't it. Um, so, uh, so that's it. I mean, I basically found my, my interviewees by three ways. One was uh, networks of journalists that I knew through this post-global project that linked me up with uh, sort of big institutional journalism organizations and outfits. That generally didn't get me youth. The other one was research PhD students who are connected and generally English speaking to the United States and then they have these tentacles that reach down into the local level and a lot of trust which I needed to sort of capitalize on to get anything meaningful out of my interviews which was almost one a day. Um, and then through word of mouth once I got to that local level. Maybe I'll show you a picture of another profile of a girl. You know, she, uh, this Sheila, the, the girl here, was a child of a, a Filipino prostitute and an a African-American Ameri uh, serviceman. And um, she's another example of the type of person I will get where, you know, she came from a very, very poor background, but she did quite well in school. She got hooked up with a charity organization that helped her get into uh, some degree of higher, higher learning, and she's thinking about going on to be a professional. If I would generalize, that's the profile of the youth I'm getting. Um, but I did try to push out on other places, but generally talk to slightly older folks. Uh, I think that's fair to say, but maybe some examples will come to mind uh, as we go. Craig, go ahead. Do you want to go ahead and sure. scroll down? Gosh. That's unfortunate. No, this has been something I've been complaining about for ages with the post. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and that, of course, got yeah. the best uh, amount of clicks you can imagine <laughs> on the front of the post webpage. This is something that. OK. I think we'll <coughs> keep on going with the question. <laughs> it'll <laughs> pop up again soon. In the tan jacket. You know, when you're living in Alangabo City, you're exposed <laughs> to bars. Let's you're exposed listen. to Americans. You can see, like, thousands of Americans or hundreds of Americans with their girlfriends but it's really hard for me to understand also or to accept that my mom is with them my father left me when i was eight months eight months old on my mother's belly oh what a nightmare why don't you hit pause and we'll okay just continue with the q a sure okay please Yeah, absolutely. So the question is, uh, what do you think about an expanded Peace Corps to get Americans out of the United States? Well, uh, one great piece that was on public diplomacy, uh, and I can maybe circulate this, this link, was about how it's very tough to do it well when Americans have such a poor understanding of the rest of the world. And it's very hard to stress the importance or make it seem like it's policy relevant. Um, and it allows them to support policies that would be damaging and they might be more <coughs> careful about otherwise. Um, I, uh, 
I completely lost it. Tell me again what the question was. <laughs> expanded Peace Corps. Oh, expanded Peace Corps. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that Karen Hughes, I think, has done quite well is increase the number of exchange programs that are going on in recent years. And despite the emphasis on selling the United States, I think she also realized intuitively how valuable it is to have interpersonal <coughs> linkages. Um, I actually, uh, I visited maybe one Peace Corps site. I'm not even sure if I did. Yeah, I think so. It was part of one of the bigger projects I saw. Um, and, uh, you know, and the experience that I heard from the person there, it's very anecdotal and small, was, was somewhat mixed, that she didn't feel like uh, the work she was doing was the most important thing there. So I, I think the Peace Corps is terrific. I think, frankly, any of these exchange programs are terrific. Um, helping is certainly one good way of doing it, but I would never discount, you know, uh, ways of building up like I said, you know, before business partnerships or novel ideas or sharing your time in a documentary video making project, trying, if you know, if you're an American filmmaker who's going to Venezuela, look, hook up with people who are there doing similar work. Um, and a bunch of friends and I are trying to do something like that to create uh, a portal for smart filmmakers around the world to share their stuff. <coughs> so, yeah. yeah. That tracks with my experience um, <coughs> having worked in the relief and development sector. Peace Corps to date, I think expanded Peace Corps could be different, um, really has its most positive impact on the Americans who do it and not so much uh, in terms of the aid project delivered or the public diplomacy um, uh, earned. So um, some more questions in back. Lady in the middle. Let me play this guy. Oh, I never, like, never saw him at all. And then, that's the fact that I'm black. It's like I'm living in the place that yeah, I'm... Okay. Great. We'll take this question and then... Oh, sure, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Right. Yeah. The question is, how did you interact with the Foreign Service officers, and, and how did you find them? My time interacting with them was mostly in Turkey, sort of the biggest interactions I had. And, you know, the U.S. Embassy has gone from the center of town on Istiklal Road to a, like, veritable fortress on the outskirts of Istanbul. And right after the PKK started bombing in Hakkari, I flew to Van and went towards Hakkari to talk to Kurdish people there. I was alone, you know, and I had some contacts, but not a lot. And when I came back and told this Foreign Service friend that I had did it, they said, you know, we don't even go there during peacetime, and if we do, we go with guards and an entourage because it would be incredibly damaging for us as Americans to be harmed. Now, this is just Turkey, but I think that there might not be the same degree of flexibility that a journalist uh, experiences or someone outside of the federal government. This is just, again, with me, I mean, anecdotal experiences, so I really can't make a trend out of it. But that was my, my sense in Turkey, that there wasn't the type of freedom that I enjoyed. Interesting. Okay. Um, how are we doing in terms of questions? Are there any questions in the field? Um, okay, well, let's run this last video, sure. and then we'll wrap up. Okay. I think it's playing. I think it's playing. <laughs> There's really no way to know. Well, this is actually good. You guys can go look at it online. I get paid by clicks, so <laughs> it's more helpful that you watch it one at a time than uh, all at once. Let's see. I apologize for the technological difficulty. No, it looks like it's a web problem more than anything else. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is really <laughs> exciting. <laughs> and we'll watch the video. <laughs> you can see like thousands of Americans or hundreds of Americans with their girlfriends. But it's really hard for me to understand also or to accept that my mom is with them. My father left me when I was eight, month, eight months old on my mother's wedding. So I never, like, no. Ah, this is not gonna work. Let's just pause it and we'll, we, I have a bunch of, e I mean, if you guys wanna share emails, I'll send you a couple of the links from this past year. There are about 150 posts and 150 videos at washingtonpost.com slash America. And, uh, I can maybe send you five or ten that I think are worth checking out. Great. And uh, please help me uh, thank Amar for this presentation.